people are logging in just give it another minute or so so we can give everybody a chance to get settled get your bibles if you're waiting for us right now make sure you grab your bible <clears throat> you know when we do bible studies it, it's nice to have your own bible and to actually look at the verses with your own eyes have a pen have a highlighter let's get deep into what what the lord wants to tell us don't be a passive listener be an active listener come and, and, and join me get out your bible Share with me this morning as we study the book of Jonah. I see people logging on. That is great. Looking forward to being with you this morning. Hope everybody is enjoying this um, pre Lenten Sunday. We still have one more week. I'm just waiting for. Hopefully we could really like set our minds to get to get ready for this time to really jump in in Lent and, and next week we'll do we'll conclude our our study on the book of Jonah and talk about how to prepare for Lent and get ready for this this very very special season of the Tikir. All right, we will get started. I see quite a bit of people online looking forward to to, to just jumping in right now. So we'll start with in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We are continuing our series called Turning Back as we study the book of Jonah. And it's one of these books that when you read it, you can't believe that this book is in the Old Testament, right? Because it's not typically what you think of when you think of the God of the Old Testament, right? Sometimes we have this thing in our mind that the God of the Old Testament is this tough God that, that punishes. And no, this is the character of God, what you see in this book. And we saw we saw in chapter one how Jonah was resisting God and he was running away from, from being in the will of God, how God was calling him to cry out against Nineveh. And we said, you know, for a lot of us who maybe don't identify with being a missionary like Jonah was, but the Nineveh that you were called to cry out against is the wicked city that's in here, that's in your heart, that, that God is, is telling you. And, and you might be running the opposite way saying, Lord, anything but that. When God really is, is wants us, he wants Nineveh to be in the will of God. He wants us to be in the will of God. And we saw how much Jonah resisted that will. And then eventually, last week, we studied the prayer of Jonah from the belly of the whale, and how God sent the whale of his grace to save Jonah. Some people, when you think, I want you to imagine if you heard that, that a loved one was swallowed by a whale, you would say, Lord, why are you doing this? Right? And And sometimes we get to we we experience those whales in our life and it seems like a whale but that whale is for our salvation that whale is to deliver us and to help us to come to our senses and we, we studied that prayer that jonah prayed from the belly of the whale i hope all of you were able to enjoy this the fast of the ninevites that we just celebrated and, and concluded this week um but this is a perfect book to be studying as we start to prepare our minds and our hearts to jump into to land so let's get right into it we are here in Jonah. Turn with me, open up your Bibles to the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. It is after um, after Hosea, after Obadiah, after Amos. Find it with me. We know that we read up to 2 verse 9, so we're going to read chapter 2 verse 10. Open up your Bibles. Don't be a passive listener. Get a pen, get a paper. Study the Word of God with me. Join, join with me as we read the Word of God. Chapter 2, verse 10 says, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now we turn to chapter 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. I love this. I love this passage. And if you look with me and you have your Bible, listen to what it says. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. When you think of how God deals with us, do you feel like we have a God that gives us second chances? Something to learn about the nature of God is that like God started with Jonah again. Jonah messed up bad. Right? He risked the lives of the people of on the boat that were with him. He basically wished all of Nineveh to be destroyed by God, didn't care about Nineveh, and was even his own soul was perishing. 
and and Jonah was just fast asleep spiritually. Well, God woke him up by by the storm and by the whale and everything that he sent his way. But here God is speaking to him a second time. God is ready to move forward with Jonah. Is that what you would imagine that God would do? I wonder, many people project their own feelings onto God, right? Their own stubbornness, their own pride, their own disappointment on God, assuming that our faults can also be attributed to God. What do I mean by that? You and I would naturally react in dealing with a Jonah saying, sorry, I, I can't trust a Jonah again. Jonah, Jonah is done. Jonah, you go back. You're no longer the man of God. I'm not going to use you. How beautiful is this wonderful verse that God, in his book, he says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Really, Lord? Really, Lord, you're going to speak to Jonah again after everything he's done and the stubbornness and the, the coldness of heart and the doubting. And, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah again a second time. How sweet is that? And, and when, when the Bible says something, don't ever take anything by chance. Like, oh, yeah, okay, God spoke to him again. Like, the Bible's not saying that God spoke to Jonah again. He's saying the second time. He's giving him like a second chance. And I want you to think about Jonah. I wonder if Jonah felt like, I'm not worthy of this call, right? Wouldn't we all assume that God would say to Jonah, you're not worthy of this call. After what you've done, you lost your chance. You've lost your call. I can't trust you anymore. I know where your heart is. You don't care about the Ninevites. You want them to die. You don't care for Nineveh or, or God's word. You know, you didn't care that God was speaking to you and, and, and he spoke to you and delivered his message to you. And you didn't care about that. You didn't care for the sailors that were perishing because of you. Isn't that what we would just assume that, that God would tell Jonah, I'm sorry, but you are not worthy of this call. And we all deal with God in that way. We all look to God in that same way and we say, God, like, I'm sure you're not going to use me again. I'm sure you've rejected me. I'm sure I lost my chance. No, that's not the God that we follow. Often the devil whispers in our ears things that you are rejected by God. When you sin and you've sinned a sin that, that brings you shame or, or, or has hurt you or has hurt others, has hurt your family, whatever it may be, you still serve a God, the God of second chances. He's the God of second chances. And I want you to believe in that like he did with Peter and David. What did, what did the Lord do with Peter? Imagine your best friend doesn't follow you to the cross, betrays you as he sees you getting scourged. Like he last night was just telling me, if they leave you, I will even die with you. And he denied him three times before servant girl. Like Peter, like be, be, be a man, man. Like what's, what's wrong with you? He denied the Lord. And the Lord came to him after his resurrection and says, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know I love you. He says, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Second chances. Think about David. David and all that he did that, that, that you know, sinned against God and the sin of Bathsheba. And how you would think that, that God would say, all right, sorry, you cannot be king over my throne. He's the God of a second chance. He restored David. He restored David. And he restores you and he restores me. And I, I really want you. Do you really think that, do you imagine that God would just put you on the shelf and say, hey, let me find someone better. This Jonah is not good enough. Um, let me find someone more obedient. No, God God is happy with just you. God is happy with just you. But we're going to understand what that means. <clears throat> because it doesn't mean like, okay, Jonah, I understand. You don't like the whole Nineveh thing. Let's just move on. Let's find something else. No, we're going to study really what this means. Look at how much when you read the word of God, we didn't move on yet. All we know is that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Reflect on that. Reflect on what that means in God's second chances in your life. Don't forget. It's so easy to forget those second chances. It's so easy to forget that, wait, shouldn't, like, didn't I mess up bad and God got me out of it again and, and he did something great and he redeemed my life and he changed me. Nothing humbles me more than seeing somebody with a broken life come before me. You know, they sit in my office and they think they are just 
that's the end of their life. They they're kicked out of their college. They their their marriage is over. Their whatever is happening to their life, and then I see God restore that person in a way beyond their imagination. I see, wow, our God is the God of second chances, and the second chance is not like a no. It is a full restoration of his of his opportunity. God doesn't just replace us like that. God doesn't replace us. He gives us second chances. A father does not replace a child. He's still waiting for you to get over your sin. Just like the father of the prodigal son. Always waiting for his son to return. Just waiting there, looking out the window saying, one day my son will return and I will restore him back to sonship. He's going to be wearing the robe, the nicest robe in the house. He's going to be doing all these you know, he's going to be, we're going to celebrate the return of my son. He's going to have a ring on his finger and sand on his feet. He's the God of second chances. He's still waiting for you to get over your sin. Maybe you're not, you're still running away. You're still resisting. God is waiting. God loves you too much. I know for, for, for the parent that wants their kid to turn around and saying, oh, don't say that. They're going to think they could, that's God. That's God. I, I, I can't change who God is. God has a heart bigger than you and I can ever imagine. He's the God of second chances. He's a father. He's not a passive father. He's an active, loving father. The Bible even says he chastens whom he loves. So, but he doesn't, this is not, this is not a thing of wrath. This is a thing of fatherly love. I want you to imagine, again, Peter was restored to his apostleship after denying Jesus, being beaten before his eyes and scourged. And he makes him an apostle again. Feed my sheep. What do you mean, Lord? Like, okay, like, forgive him, but uh, come on, he can't, he can't be an apostle anymore. <laughs> God restores. I was listening to a sermon yesterday by His Holiness Pope Shenouda, the thri thrice-blessed memory. And he was talking about, he remembers a story about a bishop who had fallen in, in in some sin in the in the early 20th century in the early 19th century 20th century I'm sorry, and he in, under the patriarch of under the papacy of Pope Ioannis, I think he was the 19th patriarch, and this bishop came and 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 met the Pope, and the bishop had made a you know a sin or or, or had made some big mistake, and the Pope called him by his name before he was a bishop by his layman's terms, and that bishop came. And like begged at his feet and said, please, like restore me again. Like I won't leave you until you restore me to the service that I once had as a bishop. Because the Pope had called him not by his the name of his ordination, but by his layman name. And then eventually, after him coming and humbling himself, the Pope called him by his the name of his of, of his ordination, his bishop name. That is the God of second chances. That is the mercy of God. He restored Thomas. He, Even though Thomas was doubting and didn't believe, he came to him and gave him another chance. And he said, here, put your hands right here. Feel, feel the, the nails in my hands. Feel the, the, the piercing in my side. He's the God of second chances. How many times is God trying to rem remind you of what his true nature is? Stop projecting some false image of who God is. This is your God. This is our God. This is why we worship him. This is why we love him. This is why we give him our whole life. Because he's the God uh, of a heart bigger than, than any words can describe. How many times has he given you a second, third, a hundred chances? Don't forget that love of God. Don't take advantage of his grace. Don't take advantage of his grace. Don't insult the spirit of his grace, as St. Paul says in Hebrews 10. Don't insult it. But he has a heart wide enough to wait and to be patiently waiting for, for you to come back. And again, remember, if you're thinking, well, like, Abuna, don't talk to me about coming back. Like, like I'm in the church. You're, you're talking to people who are, who are coming on a Sunday. They're streaming. They're listening to a sermon. This message is for a Jonah. This is for a Jonah, the prophet of Israel, who the word of the Lord came to him to preach to whole cities, right? So this is not for, this is not just the second chance of the Ninevites. This is the second chance for Jonah, for Peter, the disciple of Jesus, for Thomas, the apostle, for David, the king, the man after God's own heart. I really want to make sure that this is clear. 
if you are thinking like about your, you know, your your struggling husband who doesn't want to walk faithfully with God, no, I want you to apply it to yourself. You need the second chance of God to be back in the will of God, to be put yourself right in, in, in the place where he meant for you to be, where he called you to be, where he desires to use you. Get back in the will of God as, as, as Jonah was coming back. And we're going to see here. Here, Jonah has been caught red handed with like blatant rebellion against God, insisting on his way. This is something to rejoice about. I don't know how many times I've witnessed the second chance of God's mercy displayed over people that are hopeless. This is a reason to dance. I want you to think again, like, why are you like, do you have this joy? Do you have this rejoicing in God's overwhelming mercy and compassion and, and love for you? The, the, the worst sinner, as St. Paul says, the chief of sinners. It's unbelievable. If this doesn't bring you to dance of joy that God has restored you. I read a story of a young man who was grew up in a bad area. He had, you know, a broken home. People, these gangs used to harp on, on, on these young men and, and try to like fool them and deceive them and get, get them to join their gangs or to, to, you know, do crimes with them, to steal with them or to take drugs with them. Well, this young man got, he was a good kid, but he just got sucked up in the wrong area. You know, these these gangs would beat him up every day. And finally, eventually, he, he joined them. And he got caught in the middle of, of, of an alley where there was there was a drug deal, and they're selling drugs, and he was there. And then somebody pulled out a gun, and he pulled out a gun, and he shot somebody, and he killed someone. This young man, and his life was ruined. He got arrested. The police came, and they put him in this like correctional facility, and he had until he was like you know eighteen, and then he was going to go on trial for for murder. And he knew that 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 was it. I messed up bad. Of course, I killed somebody's somebody's son. I killed somebody's you know grandchild. Of course, I'm going to get punished. He goes up to the court, and the grandma of the person that he killed shows up to court, and she goes and she speaks before. The, the the judge and the jury and they said you know to the grandma do you have anything to say she said judge i want to ask you to give this boy a second chance i want to ask you to give this boy a second chance this is the grandmother okay of the boy that was murdered by that guy and she looked to the face of the judge and the judge said please give this boy a second chance and he was let off the hook he was let off the hook and he was set free. Isn't that like, can you imagine the, the, the feeling of God's mercy and the deliverance that is experienced in a moment like that? Isn't that a, like, like a reason to rejoice? Isn't that a reason to rejoice in God, to cling to him and say, Lord, there's no greater love than you. There's no bigger heart than yours. There's no more compassionate and, and, and never failing love than like yours, Lord. For me, the chief of sinners. Again, I have to remind myself sometimes when, when I'm when I'm counseling people and, and they're in this place of despair and everything is messed up. I know my God. I have to remind myself, remind yourself of the God of this second chance. He will come through and that's who he is because he loves. I don't know how many times, I don't know how many times I told God to give me a second chance and I promised, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to react differently. I'm going to be better next time. And I failed the test. How many times have you realized that God is putting you through a test and you failed that test? Like you, 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 you thought very highly of yourself. You know, I'm going to get through this test. I'm going to pass it. God is going to be so proud of me. And I, I, I was angry and I gossiped and I fought and I was stubborn and I, whatever. And God, I said, Lord, like, like, I know, I know you gave me a chance to prove myself and I failed. Over and over again, God gives me second chances to show him, to really prove, like, like St. Peter, when he says, look, you love me. Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. To give me a chance to tell him, Lord, I, I, I love you. Let's continue to our passage. Look at verse 2. Arise. So Jonah chapter 3, verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and preach to it the message that I tell you. All right, we're going to try to 
study here, it says, arise and go to Nineveh. This isn't like, you know what, Jonah, you've been through so much with the whale thing and the storm, and, and it's so hard for you to go to the Ninevites. Fine, buddy, man, just, just go back to just go back to land. Be the prophet of Israel. Don't worry about it. Sorry I asked so much of you. That's also not what Christ, what God did. God said, arise and go to Nineveh. A lot of us, you assume that the whale came and vomited Jonah in Nineveh. So he just woke up, and woke up, you know, brushed himself off and started preaching to the people. No, you know where he took him. Some scholars say that he went back to Joppa. He went back to where he started, where he had fled from the presence of the Lord. And he said, arise, go to Nineveh. I'm giving you the calling all over again. You see full detail, full obedience, full detailed obedience. The, every detail that God asked of him is still required of Jonah. So he sent him back from square one and he said, arise, go to Nineveh. Like, here we go again. Here we go again, Jonah. This is your chance. You see, when God calls, there's no shortcut. God, God has a plan for the journey. He didn't just give Jonah the shortcut, drop him off in Nineveh. All right, go do your thing. Remember how we said that, you know, Joppa was here. Nineveh is 500 miles away. And Tarshish was the complete opposite direction. So, of course, Jonah went the opposite direction. It was going to be a 500-mile journey. Chances are, if he goes during that 500-mile journey, he's not coming back. He's going to spend the rest of his life in Nineveh, and he doesn't know what's going to happen when he gets there. You see, God doesn't like shortcuts. That journey, that 500-mile journey of going back to Nineveh is something that God wanted to work back into his life. He was going to use those 500 miles, that, that time of that journey, to work in his heart, to prepare him, to lead him closer to God, to remove him of his pride that journey the journey of the wilderness of, of the israelites for 40 years it was necessary god doesn't like shortcuts god doesn't believe in shortcuts because every process and every journey is required because in the journey there is something happening to you somebody was telling you know i was sitting with somebody earlier and they're like well why is god allowing it's part of the journey it, 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 there's no shortcut how else is God, remember we always say, I always say this in my sermons, I want you to know this. The whole goal of our Christian life, the Orthodox life, the sacramental life, is to become transformed into the image of God, to become like Christ. That's the whole goal. The goal is not to be washed of your sins and go to heaven. The goal, your whole walk is to become like Christ. That's everything. And that journey, that 500 you journey, that 500 mile journey, is part of the way that God is going to prepare Jonah to become really his, his great prophet. Abraham wanted to take the shortcut as well, right? You know, seeing no results from God's promise, he told him, leave your father, leave your, your, your family, leave everything you know and go to a place that I will show you. And you will be, um, you will have children as the, as the sand of the seashore and the stars of the sky and all these promises. For 25 years, Abraham never had any of those promises fulfilled. So what did he do? I don't know. May, maybe God wants me to have a child not through Sarah, through Hagar. A shortcut. Maybe God didn't mean this difficult way. So he took a shortcut. No. You're going to have a child through Sarah, which was Isaac. That is the way. There's no shortcuts. I want you to think about even like Jesus. Think about Jesus in the wilderness. And we're going to be fasting the, the, these 40 days of Lent. The devil was trying to get Jesus to take a shortcut. He says, look, turn this, the, the stones into bread to satisfy your hunger. And he says, no, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. No shortcuts. I'm not going to take a shortcut. You see, Jesus taught us that there are no shortcuts when God calls you. God desires your obedience over everything. Turn with me your Bible to 1 Samuel in a time where Saul had disobeyed God. 1 Samuel chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. I'll give you a second to turn there. You see, Saul went to war 
and he was waiting for Samuel to arrive so that Samuel could offer a sacrifice. Saul was just a king. He wasn't a priest. But Samuel was a little bit late. So what did Saul do? We need God's blessing. I'm going to offer a sacrifice. But you're not a priest, Saul. You're not supposed to offer sacrifices. It's okay. God will understand. No, God wants your obedience, Saul. God wants you to trust and be obedient to everything he asks you. But, but like, what was I going to do? We never offered a sacrifice. We're going to war. This is a big deal. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. When Samuel spoke to Saul and says, what is this that you've done? You made a big mistake by, by offering the sacrifice. He says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Imagine Samuel, the priest who offers sacrifices and offerings is telling Saul, does God delight in sacrifices? Does he like sacrifices more than you obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed or listen than the fat of rams that is offered for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Rebelling against God and what he's telling you to obey is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. You see, what I want you to understand is that there's no shortcuts. God wants you to obey. Sometimes when, when you know, we give our kids a consequence, you know, that, that we ask them to do something, they insist on not doing, they get a consequence. And they come and they, you know, apologize and we hug and kiss and, and all right, kids, like I forgive you. I'm not mad at you. I love you. You still have to go and do what I asked you to do, whatever chore it was or, or mowing the lawn or whatever it is that I'm asking or requiring you to do. Even though I loved you and we hugged and we kissed and you felt so bad and I accepted your apology and I still need you to do what I asked you to do. That's part of how I'm, I'm what I'm asking of you because that's how I'm raising you. I'm growing you in a special way and I need you to follow my instructions for your life because it has purpose. Nothing God asks of you has no purpose. It has purpose and you have to obey it as it is. This is so important. Jesus knew that he had to fulfill all that his father required of him. And so he continued and he went through everything. Imagine even the Lord Jesus was circumcised. The Lord Jesus Christ took flesh as an eight-day-old child and was circumcised in the flesh. He had to go through the whole journey. Being born of a woman, like what God is being born of, man, like of a human, no way. God went through the whole journey. You also need to go through the whole journey because there's beautiful experiences on that journey. When the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, what did they experience on that journey? What was God building them? A faith that he protects them from the enemies and he's going to destroy Pharaoh and he will light the way with the pillar of fire. and He's going to part the seas. And if you're hungry, he's going to send manna from heaven. And when you're thirsty in the middle of a desert, I want to teach you that he can bring water out of a rock and satisfy your thirst. Imagine if they just went from... Egypt, one day they left Pharaoh and they go to promised land. I don't care about God. They're not going to know God. They're not going to experience God and his love and his power and his works and his might. No, no, they needed that journey. No shortcuts. Or when when a family goes through a tragedy, you know, sometimes when, when you know, I deal with parents that, that have their, their kids make mistakes that are going to affect the whole family that, that are not retraceable, right? You can't, you can't, you can't go back on some of these mistakes where, where a kid does something that will, will turn his or her life around and their parents' life around because it's a big deal. I want you to think about this. We try to find loopholes around what is required of them at the time. Okay, like how to make it easy. Sometimes God doesn't want things to be easy for the person that sinned. Not because he's trying to punish them, because that's how he's going to change them. They're never going to change. And I have a parent that came to me and said, Abuna, this is like the 10th crisis that I'm dealing with. Like it, it, it never ends. I'm going crazy. I can't handle any more of this. And, and I told the parent, you've been bailing your child out his or her whole life. 
they're getting shortcuts so they never learn the lesson. You paid the price, but not the child. No, you can't make things easier. God sometimes wants us to go back to Joppa and arise and go to Nineveh. I want to see if you're going to obey this one more time. That's the second chance. We can't interpret the second chance as, as God has forgotten about what happened. I want you to think right now, what was the last thing that God asked you to do? Did you obey him? You know, a lot of us, we move on and we say, okay, what's the next thing? You know, in, in sometimes people want to serve a new ministry or I want to serve, you know, older ages or I want to do this or that. Did you obey the first thing that God asked you for God to give you? And there's no shortcut. God wanted this of you. God called this, called you to, to this certain service or to this. Did you obey that before you start asking for other things? God wants your obedience. And if you've ignored that calling and you've rejected that calling, he's willing to give you a second chance. But I want you to figure out where were you short in obeying? What was the last thing <clears throat> that God asked of you that you didn't like it? And you didn't want to do, but that thing was a stepping stone for your next adventure with God. You have to go back and do it. Did you skip it? Go back to that first thing that you neglected or avoided. Think about it and say, Lord, I will obey. Give me a second chance. Maybe God intervened in your life and you don't like it. Like, like the whale. He sent you a whale. So you went the other way. God, he, he pressed you to hear to do something, to carry something for him, to give to him in some way, to donate to maybe it's money or maybe your time or to sacrifice. And this one thing, it was going to be a little bit difficult. It's going to be uncomfortable. It might be physical pain. And you said, no, I'm not going to do it. Really? God knows the journey. He knows why he's putting you on this journey. He knows what he needs to accomplish in you, specifically you. Why you and not me? Because what he's going to work in you through this journey is not what he, he's going to work with me in a different way. You have to go on the journey. You have to obey. Obedience is a big thing. I, I, I think sometimes we, we take the spiritual life kind of lightly and we take it for granted. Obedience is a big thing to God and we need to consider it. Don't take the easy way out. God wants to change you to become like him. So here we go, Nineveh, or, or Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, but he's not just asking your physical presence, okay? There's some people that they obey, but their heart is not in it. Imagine God is telling Jonah, go to Nineveh, serve there, fine, I'll go to Nineveh. You people are going to hell, whether you, you, know, you know, his heart is not into it. He, he doesn't care about what God wants. Even though you've given your physical presence, you say, I'm obeying. I'm like, what else do you want? Like, I went and I'm serving where you asked me to serve, or I'm, 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 I apologize when you ask me to apologize, or I'm fine. I'm going to go help my, my parents or my mom. I'm, I'll do it. But are you doing it with your heart? Your physical presence it, it can, can deceive other people, right? But to obey with your heart and your will. And see what God wants. That's considered, if you're not doing that, that's called internal running. It's just helping you get away in the eyes of others. Like people see, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're serving. In the eyes of others, you're fine. But if you internally, in your heart, are not giving your heart to what God has asked you to do, you're just kind of going through the emotions physically. Sure, I'm there, but I don't care. Don't be that person. You might be physically there, but you're internally running away from God. You can be somewhere present and internally running away. Some responsibility. Making everything work out for yourself conveniently. Fine, I can I can do this and as long as I can I can make it work conveniently. But you're not accomplishing what God is working in you and through you and for you. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Rise, go to Nineveh. Let's compare the two callings of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 3, let's turn back to Jonah chapter 3. He says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Now turn with me to Jonah chapter 1, verse 2. What does it say? He says, Arise, go to Nineveh. It's the same thing. 
that great city and cry out against it for their wickedness has come up before me. It's pretty much the same call, but there's a little bit a difference. Are they the same really? Again, turn again. Jonah chapter three, verse two. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Okay, that's that's the second call. The first call, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. What's the difference? He told him what to do exactly when he got there. But the second call included one extra level of responsibility. It still means I'm going to Nineveh one way. That didn't change. He still had to make a bold like announcement to the Ninevites. That didn't change. But he's saying, you're going to have to keep your ears open later for further instructions about what your message is going to be. You see, believe it or not, in Jonah chapter 3, verse 2, there's a hidden promise in there. Look for it. Listen to what he said. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. More is coming from me. That's what God is saying. I'm going to be with you. What I'm promising you is my presence, that my word will speak through you. That now you don't have to worry about what you're going to say. You know, as a, as a preacher, as a speaker, before I go on stage or, or I speak before a crowd of people, I think about, okay, what am I going to say? And I plan, is my, is my sermon going to be, you know, appropriate? Is it too long? Is it whatever? I know some of your pe people are saying, okay, your, your sermon is too long. It's okay. We're just going through the chapter to follow along. Imagine he, he's trying to plan what, what God wants of him. Okay. But this is what he's saying. He's saying, believe it or not, in this hidden promise, he's saying, I will be with you in my presence. God is going to speak to you and for you this message. If you follow, if you obey, I'm going to lead. I'm going to. It wasn't easy as him just canceling the call and asking something different of him. No, he's saying, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to work through you. Moses discovered he didn't want to continue on the journey at one point in the 40, in the 40 uh, years in the wilderness. God said, fine, you guys go to the promised land, but I'm not going with you. Moses says, we're not going anywhere without your presence. We need your presence. He made God promise his presence. As long as you are with me, I can go to Nineveh. I can speak to this Nineveh that is so rebellious and sinful and, and not wanting to change. If I know, Lord, that you are going to do it. See, it's the leadership of the Holy Spirit leading you always and guiding you as a helper. God's spirit will be with you every step of the way. Do you believe in that power? You see, Jonah, when he knew that God was going to speak, he was encouraged. It's not going to be my words. I don't need to think about. He says, wait till I give you the message that you're going to deliver to them. You see, when you feel like you can't do it anymore, like I can't overcome this, this, this sin, this lust, this, this habit, whatever it may be, I can't do it. This is when God says, don't worry. I'm going to speak through your mouth to Nineveh. I'm going to speak to your heart to change Nineveh. Will you let me? Will you let me change Nineveh? Will you let me fix this part inside of you that needs changing? The big difference is, is that I'm going to give you the message. Something, something so, so powerful. Now, Nineveh wasn't a small city. It was large and it wasn't expected to be an easy task. Uh, some scholars say there was about 600,000 inhabitants including the surrounding villages and areas around Nineveh, okay? It's like going to New York City. I send you to New York City, and I tell you, I want you to go and preach to New York City and tell them this message. They were so evil. They were so violent. I've been on mission trips for, for, for more than 25 years, and I've been in some pretty very adventurous, scary situations, but there is nothing better than the assurance of God's presence. When God sends you to a place that you know is scary, and I don't know what's going to happen when we get there. I don't know how the devil is going to fight us. When God promises us his presence, you fear nothing. You see fireworks. You see the Lord doing miracles and, and wondrous things. It's amazing. When he promises you his spirit, if God is leading you somewhere, follow. 
when there's a great challenge, there's a great opportunity to experience God in a mighty way. And maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you can attest to everything that I'm saying. Believe me, God, he wants to do something mighty through you. And he's giving you a great opportunity to go and speak to Nineveh to see a true transformation. Let's, let's move on. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Um, Abuna Mark was sharing me what the, the original Hebrew means by overthrown. It means it's going to be turned upside down, either through repentance or through destruction. It's not just going to be overthrown like you're going to be destroyed. No, what it really means is, Listen to it. It says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's either going to be overthrown, meaning turned upside down from repentance or from destruction by continue, continuing in sin. You see, Jonah had an anointing. This was the message. In Hebrew, his sermon was five words. Us as, as, as preachers, we come up with creative illustrations and funny stories in the middle and catchy phrases for people to enjoy our sermons and to be excited. Jonah had five words and everybody changed. The king, the, the, the adults, the children, the animals, everybody fasted by five words. Those were people whose hearts were prepared to repent. If you're looking for some exciting charismatic sermon with cool illustrations and me doing an icebreaker before the talk. And maybe you're not ready to repent. I'll do my part. I'll, I'll do my part to give you the message as God gives it to me. But these people heard five words in their language, five words. And it turned the whole city, the most wicked city in the world, New York city at that time, you know, like what would you imagine this big, big city that's like so intimidating. He turned it upside down through five words. That's the difference between him speaking and God speaking. You're trying to convince Nineveh to change. You're trying to convince yourself. But when you hear it from the mouth of God, that's why you need to be in his word. That's why you need to be in his presence in prayer. That when God speaks to you, when he speaks to this Nineveh in your heart, that it can be overthrown in 40 days. The 40 days that are coming up in this land that we're approaching. In 40 days, this Nineveh can be overthrown if you let me. But this is not from my mouth. You have to hear it from the mouth of God. That's the difference between having words to say and having God's words to say. Let's continue reading. It says, so the people of Nineveh, listen to this repentance. They heard five words. How many sermons did you hear this week? This week versus these people probably only heard these five words their whole life. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast. We have a fast coming up. If you want to repent, you want to become a new Jonah, you want to become the new Ninevites, you want to become like them, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth. They changed their appearance from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe. Look at the change. The king took off his own robe and put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. If you're coming to Abuna to ask for some excuse on, on how you can get away with making this fast easy on yourself, you're never going to be like the Ninevites. They were serious about their repentance. They knew what needed to change. It says, but let man and beast be covered. So they even had their animals fast. Even everything they own, they put at risk, you know, not feeding your animals as well. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Simple obedience, empowered by God's presence and anointing, will make that change. Maybe you need to have 
that tough conversation. Like you, there's something you need to obey God. You need to have a tough conversation with somebody. Trust, believe it or not, God is working in the background. I was reading a, a commentary and it said that previously, years before this event between Jonah, a few years before, there had been two terrible plagues that killed many in Nineveh. God was working them up, getting them ready for this moment. Everything that God's been doing in your life, he's been working, preparing you for this moment. Do you want to change? Do you want this Lent that is coming up to be the best Lent ever, that Nineveh would be a new city, a city for Christ, that this place would be where Jesus dwells, where Jesus is, is in your heart and he's living inside of you? Obedience is the way. How do you respond to God's second chance? Jonah went and the Ninevites went. Don't doubt that everything that you've been going through is maybe like what the Ninevites were going through. They had two plagues. We're, we're in a pandemic. Maybe that God is, is working your, your heart up, your life up, so that when you hear those five magic words that come from his mouth, from his spirit to change, you will respond faithfully and you will give your heart and your life to him. But only you can respond correctly. God is initiating. He's giving you that chance. Don't be that stubborn heart resisting what God wants to do in your life. And glory be to God forever. Amen. We're going to end here with prayer. If anyone has any questions, um, I will, uh, just, I'll check in the chat. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We give you thanks for your abundant mercy and compassion and love. Lord, we're not worthy that you don't give us second chances, you give us a hundred chances. Lord, what can, what can we do to become like Nineveh, that when it heard words from your mouth, when they heard your message, they could turn, that they made it, they proclaimed a fast, and they made a change in their life. Lord, we admit that there's fear. There's fear to go speak to Nineveh. This, this part within us that, that, that maybe there's going to be pain or maybe it's going to be hard or difficult, Lord. But we trust that when we obey, the promise of your spirit will lead us, will work through us and in us and do mighty wonders. Lord, we are waiting for your mighty wonders to transform us during this upcoming Lenten season, that you would really, on this journey, on this journey to Nineveh, on this journey in which we go and we obey once again, not taking shortcuts, but giving our whole heart to you. We trust, Lord, that you will make a difference in our lives. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Through the presence of St. Mary and St. Mark and all the saints, make us worthy to pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless all of you. I wish you all um, a blessed last week before Lenten fast. Let this week be a week in which you really get yourself prepared, ready to dive in wholeheartedly in this fast to give your heart and your mind and your new life to Christ. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you all.